because it's, it's sort of maybe symbolic of trust, I don't know. Uh, but uh, Jeff Rosen will be joining us. He had another session uh, that he is being transported from and should arrive as we speak. Um, I'm really proud to have Paula Kerger, who's president of the Public Broadcasting System, and Craig Newmark, who's the founder of Craigslist and head of Craig, of Newmark, Craig Newmark Philanthropies. Um, so thank you, and Jeff, uh, I'll introduce Jeff Rosen in absentia. He is a law professor, uh, and he is head of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. So uh, we're delighted you're here. Uh, we are, uh, you might have noticed that uh, our democracy is in a crisis, at least that's what our 27 members of the Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy determined, that we have a crisis of democracy, a crisis of citizenship, and, um, and we need to do something quickly about it. Uh, the crisis, though, has not, is not an instant crisis. It isn't just a recent from the last election or something. It's a 40-year decline in public's trust in our media and in our democratic institutions. And some of the lowest rated uh, items for trust are uh, Congress, I think pretty much at the lowest, big business, uh, TV station, TV news, and newspapers are way down, uh, very far down. Military, police are high up still in trust, uh, and we'll get to some other uh, uh, entities that are high in trust. Um, and we, uh, so disturbed about this, the Knight Foundation uh, commissioned our Aspen Institute program to uh, create a commission that would look at the causes of this distrust and then what could we do about it. And uh, we had 27 members, two were ex officio, so 25 members from uh, very conservative to quite liberal, from the arts, from uh, platforms, from media, from uh, civic institutions, uh, law professors, uh, a wide variety of uh, individuals to be kind of representative of our society. And uh, over a two-year period, we went around the country, we heard from the public, and came out with our report uh, in February. And in the back of the room, I have both a brochure of our recommendations and the full report called Crisis in Democracy, Renewing Trust in America. So I hope the people who are here in attendance will uh, pick up a copy if you're interested, and, uh, or at least of the brochure. So what did this uh, commission find. First of all, the causes of the decline, uh, first of all, decline in, in democracy, is that, uh, you know, governments haven't performed all that well. Uh, there's a great polarization. There's uh, income inequality, which has led to a distrust and a, f uh, a lack of upward mobility. Those were some of our findings for uh, why, um, and then one other, which was the global shifts, the, the whole uh, changes in immigration, in uh, technology, in, uh, in digitization, that kind of thing. Uh, then there's, we looked also at why is there a decline in trust in the press. And there you now have the entire world as sources of news. So we have a tremendous proliferation of news sources. At the same time, we have a disintermediation of news through our social media. So people are getting and they're not sure you know, sometimes a, a credible news source looks the same as, uh, you know, your uh, neighbor or somebody who you've never heard of. Um, the, uh, there is a perception of bias, which is a blurring of the line between fact and opinion. And uh, that's, frankly, uh, came to us more from conservatives than from liberals, if we, if we could say. They really felt that there's a tremendous uh, bias uh, going on in the press. Um, we also, uh, obviously, the spread of uh, misinformation and disinformation. The language we use, we didn't use fake news. We talked about misinformation, which were falsities which were not necessarily malicious, and disinformation, which is intentional uh, uh, infliction of uh, false information. And, you know, we've seen a lot of that. that, that that obvious is something obvious to all of us. Uh, and very importantly, the decline in local news. We have 
news deserts now all over the country. Uh, some of our major uh, news sources are thriving right now. Some would call it a Trump bump, that you know, people are now attending the news, looking at news because it's, it's so crazy right now, um, are, are for one reason or another. But they are not uh, supporting local news. And it is uh, uh, also the fact that a lot of the digital advertising has gone to the uh, platform. So the, the uh, uh, financial sources for the uh, local news entities is, uh, has declined. So with that, uh, and a discussion about the importance of trust and a healthy distrust to society. So we need trust because if you don't trust in your government and your fellow people to uh, run the government, which a lot of people don't anymore, people in one party, and this happens for both parties, do not trust the other party to run the government. Uh, that's really, a, I think, a, a tremendously bad development for a healthy society, healthy democracy. Um, as we uh, think about this, though, uh, you also need a, a distrust. You can't just have uh, a blind trust in government or in our institutions. And that's why a healthy press is so important, particularly at the local level, because at the national level, we have a lot of entities that are looking at the uh, the players, uh, the, um, the government, and other people who are affecting it. But at the local level and at the state level, there's very little, and that just opens up the opportunities for corruption. So with that, uh, one of the things I'm very proud of of this commission is, even though we had a wide variety of people, it was a unanimous report. There were no dissents. And by the way, it included uh, people like um, Everybody from like Amy Gutman, who's president of the University of Pennsylvania, to like Chris Ruddy, who is, uh, runs Newsmax, a conservative outlet, and uh, dines with President Trump at, at Mar-a-Lago, uh, to uh, uh, Charlie Sykes, who uh, was supposed to be on this panel, but got the, because of a rescheduling, he's moderating another panel, but uh, he was a tremendous uh, asset to the group. Um, it was co-chaired by Tony Marks, who is the uh, president of the New York City Public Library, and Jamie Woodson, a Republican legislator, former legislator from uh, Tennessee. And um, so what did they come out with? Basically, uh, the idea was to have a compass, not a map. In other words, let's give some direction where it should go. And Aspen Institute, being a values-based uh, organization, looked at, uh, at, at values. So when you look at these recommendations, you'll see a, an important value up front, and then there's some recommendations under each one. Um, first of all, for the, to instill greater trust in the media itself, um, we went to radical, number one, radical transparency. That the public should understand where, these, uh, where the news comes from, both within the news organization and if it's on social media, from social media. We wanted to uh, have both the uh, social media and the news entities work together to help us understand the sources of the news um, and also encourage uh, more involvement with local communities uh, by the press. Um, second, and that gets to local journalism, uh, there's a dearth of local journalism that needs radical uh, support. I, they didn't, we didn't use the word radical in that case, but uh, so out of this report, a, a, a man, one of our, um, oh here's, uh, one of our uh, commissioners, John Thornton, who is a venture capitalist in Austin, Texas, uh, formed something called the American Journalism Project and has raised, uh, the last I saw, which was several months ago, raised $43 million for venture ph uh, philanthropy to help local journalism. He was a founder of the Texas Tribune, which is an example of that, uh, of that type of journalism. Um, but we really urge much more attention to local journalism. And uh, we really felt that it needs to be thought of now as a source of, uh, as a recipient of philanthropy. That it's, that the business models for local journalism are so tough. Uh, not that we don't support that, but that it is now it, it's a civic institution that you need to think about. Um, greater innovation, the news, we, we said some of the news uh, lost out, but they, 
some of it's their own fault, some of it isn't, but that there needs to be some new measures for innovation. I won't go into that at this point. And greater diversity of inclusion uh, in the uh, newsrooms. Uh, when we got to uh, technology, uh, we suggested that collectors of data and information, which uh, is an important area of trust, uh, we did not go for the, we, we certainly understand the, uh, the idea of a, a strong privacy legislation. We didn't get into that because that's being subject right now. Uh, I think there will be privacy legislation. But as opposed to ownership of data and uh, this other approach, we took the second approach, which is called uh, the fiduciary, a fiduciary obligation on the part of the data collector. So what we're saying is, rather than just uh, allowing, you know, having ownership, but people sell it very freely for you know, access to a website or something, that the requirement would be on the purveyor, on the uh, actual platform, uh, or the collector of data to uh, have a fiduciary duty <coughs> to the user. One of the most profound things that I heard in these um, uh, hearings that we had on, on the way to the report was a woman in Silicon Valley named uh, Gina Bianchini who said at a certain date, social networks became social media. And it's profound because when you're a social network, the user is the is the user, that's, the, I mean, that's the customer. In a social media, the user is the product being sold to advertisers and basically an entity that being, where data is being collected about them to be sold to advertisers. So it, it's a profound difference and therefore we felt like the uh, entity that's doing that needs to have a fiduciary responsibility. This was the brainchild of a, of a, law, a couple of law professors, uh, John Balkan and, and Jonathan Zittrain. Um, and then we urged, uh, uh, we urged greater transparency on the part of the, uh, the, the platforms, including uh, we suggested not, uh, there, there, there's something called the honest ads uh, legislation that's, that's in Congress right now, hasn't been passed, which says you have to disclose who has uh, sponsored a political ad. We say we should know who sponsored any ad. So we went beyond what the, not what the present dialogue is and saying there's a, there's a requirement in the Federal Communications Act that on broadcasting you have to disclose who sponsored uh, any particular uh, segment, which is the old, for people who remember, the, the old days of payola on radio. And that's what that legislation came out of. Um, and we are saying that should be applied to all media. Uh, and then innovation, there should be data portability. I don't know if you saw uh, Mark Zuckerman earlier in the Ideas Festival, but uh, he, he agreed with uh, the idea of data portability, that you should be able to move to other uh, uh, networks and uh, other measures to encourage uh, the creation of other networks. The kind of surprising thing, I think, to our sponsors was that we then went into citizenship with the thinking that, you know, if we demanded good government, we would get it. We are not demanding enough of ourselves as citizens and of our institutions. And so we went into a third section, which are recommendations around citizenship. Um, first, that um, we have a, a, a system of literacy. Uh, we, it, it's appalling what the level of literacy is uh, in this country in civics. Uh, I, I'm, I'll just sort of. I just want to interject. We only have 15 minutes, so it's yeah. yeah. 15 minutes, and then I'd like to hear from the other speakers. We are. I don't mean to be rude, but it just. It no, no. Time. One of the speakers couldn't, the, the person, so I'm going to lay out what it is, and then the rest of it will be the speakers. I, I understand I'm the least person that you want to hear from. But, um, but the, uh, the citizenship uh, issue is that there should be greater civic literacy, that there should be greater digital literacy. Um, second, that there should be greater uh, dialogue locally among political groups and uh, across political and economic uh, barriers. And third, um, our, our third area was that we recommended national service. So with that, uh, and uh, I'm, I am now ready to uh, introduce, and fortunately we now have uh, Jeff Rosen, uh, who I've introduced already, um, but Paula, uh, the 
first thing I mentioned was about the loss of trust in media. Mm -hmm. And I said there are some institutions that do have trust. Yeah. And on that uh, scale, PBS is among the very highest institutions that elicit trust. Why? So um, first, there's such a huge amount to unpack in that report. Um, you know, um, and there's so many directions that we could take this conversation. But starting with trust, because I think it is fundamental. Um, and I, I think that you know, for us, um, the fact that we are trusted is really rooted in, in two fundamental things. Well, I, I would say more than that, obviously. Uh, the mission for us is to treat the people that are consuming our content as citizens and not consumers. Uh, but I think that um, beyond that, our stations were all founded within communities. Um, I don't run a network. I run, in essence, a co-op. All of our stations are individually governed. They're individually managed. They're individually funded at the community level. And I think it's much easier to have distrust of a media organization that is from away than having distrust of a media organization where the head of that company or the reporters are sit standing next to you at your kid's soccer game. Um, I think that the ability to be able to tell community stories has a lot more uh, integrity and authenticity if it comes from people that live within those communities. They understand not only the issues, but they understand the nuance of, of, of it so much better because they're within community. And I would say the third is actually our economic structure. We exist not because of federal support. Uh, we get 15% of our funding from the federal government. That's 1-5%. That money actually goes out to our stations. It doesn't stay in Washington. And it was, uh, it's an important piece, so I don't mean to diminish it, even though it sounds like a small number. Um, it was, it was um, de uh, determined that in this public-private partnership, there were parts of the country that would not be able to afford to sustain a public television or public radio station without some level of, of support. And so I used to run a station. I was the COO of our station in New York City. And uh, the percentage of our budget that was from the federal government was probably about 6%. Um, I, I spend most of my time on the road. Um, and I visit many stations where, particularly they're serving rural communities, that the percentage of their budget that comes from the federal government is closer to 50. But the point is, that, um, and clearly for those stations, if the government funding went away, it would be existential, which is why we fight so hard to try to hold on to it. But the point is, where does the money come from to support public television it, or public radio? It comes from people who are willing to dig down their pockets and write a check and maybe get a tote bag or a mug, um, but hopefully um, feel that they're part of something that is fundamentally important. And I think it's that, and so much of the philanthropy that flows into public television is small dollars. So we are, I think, really a very small d democratic organization. And people are not going to support an organization they don't trust. And people are not going to support an organization that is not providing value. So I think that has kept us really very close to our guide star of creating content that we hope, when appropriate, is entertaining, but also educational, inspirational, because people would not support us if we, if we didn't do that. So one of the things we were hoping were that, was that philanthropists would step up to address local journalism. And Craig Newmark, you're a philanthropist who has done exactly that. Well, can you tell us a little about what you've, where you've invested in local journalism? It's very uh, modest, because even as the commission was proceeding, the, uh, I, it occurred to me that uh, you know we live in neighborhoods, we live in small communities, we want to know what's going on with city hall or the school board, and sometimes we just step outside and we're wondering uh, what that smell is. So. We live, in the, uh, we live in the local. <laughs> so I started putting my uh, money where my mouth is, focusing a lot on uh, New York, in part because the tremendous irony, New York City is kind of the center of national media, and yet New York has become something of a uh, news desert. So I'm helping out something new called the city.nyc. Uh, online only has already been breaking, I believe what they sco call scoops. I'm supporting WNYC because I like public radio in a big way. And uh, they have a publication called uh, uh, Gothamist, mm -hmm. which is where I, found, where I find all my celebrity uh, vermin news. <laughs> like, uh, you know, you all remember Pizza Rat. Now there's a uh, Bagel Rat. We don't know what happened to the Mandarin Duck, though, but I'm sure he was delicious. <laughs> 
uh, in a greater scope. Um, I remember the American Journalism Project is building on the success of the Texas Tribune. They figured out how to build uh, infrastructure, including for business models, um, as for how a new local newspaper could actually get the job done. And finally, then there's Report for America. The deal is these organizations do need uh, substantial contributions to uh, get going, but it's important to put one's money where, mon where one's mouth is. And we're especially grateful for a Report for America because it's enabled us to put some reporters in places we couldn't have afforded otherwise. So it's great. Do you all know what that organization is? It's like Teach for America, but it's not kids coming out of school. It's, it's, it's reporters that are, you know, sort of mid-career and, and, and putting them into rural communities. I'm very grateful for the recent season of Endeavor. Yeah. It was really good. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, Paula, let me just stay with the local journalism for a minute. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, we think of PBS as the news hour and all, but what's going on at the local stations and how can we enhance? One of the things that we proposed in the uh, report was that there be more collaboration, national and local, and also within locals. Yeah. And, and, you know, so I think that for us, there's a lot of opportunity when Bill Kling is sitting three seats uh, down. Uh, and was the former president of American Public Media, uh, which is uh, another extraordinary media organization that has served our country well with the journalism that it provides. Uh, but partnership between television and radio, I think, is, is really important. A number of our stations actually are both. Um, and um, so as joint licensees, um, San Diego is a great example. Uh, the, um, the station there looked at what they saw as a, as a rapid decline in print journalism and, and made a deep investment in bringing the journalism of radio and television and digital together and really has, uh, has put a newsroom together that has no separation between the various platforms but really looks at what are the stories that need to be covered. Um, and we're deep in discussions with our colleagues, um, obviously, with in, in uh, public radio as we look not just at the coverage of the election, but, you know, what happens after that? You know, I think that um, we're very interested in making sure that the issues come forward, that it's not breathlessly following the next tweet, that it's not just lurching from, you know, one crazy thing to another, but really trying to step back, understand what the big issues are that people around the country are are, um, are, are most specifically grappling with and figuring out how do you actually bring that to discussion. And I think the, the other thing that, you know, that our um, stations can do both in television and radio is that we have the, the primacy of place. So, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion um, anonymously in, in digital, but I think that people hunger to come to places like this and to be in a room and to, and to look at each other in the eye, not look down, and talk to one another about, you know, the profound problems within communities and how they're solved. And I think that um, our stations are spending a lot of time now thinking about you know, how can we really do more of that? How can we really be part of partnerships with other organizations and universities and so forth? And the Constitution Center, we've been in discussions with them about really looking at how do you amp that up. So, Jeff, uh, that is, now we get to the citizenship part. We recommended a cross-dialogue uh, and, and, and greater civic literacy. I know you're involved in civic literacy. Maybe you could see what, you know, where do you see that civic literacy, uh, the whole area of civic literacy going? So the report identifies a crucial problem, namely without civic literacy, the republic will collapse. That's how strong the report is in identifying the fact that when only a third of Americans can name all three branches of government and a third can name any branch of government, you have young people who are more likely to support authoritarian alternatives to democracy than older people. So the challenge of civic literacy is not <coughs> hypothetical. The other thing is that without learning the habits of how to disagree without being disagreeable, to have civil dialogue, to bring together people of different perspectives who disagree and are able to speak to each other uh, respectfully, uh, our democracy will continue to diverge into polarized red and blue tribal camps. So that's the promise. Thank you, even better, Mike. Now I can talk about the solution. Uh, uh, I'm not sure this one looks better, but I'll just speak loudly. <laughs> um, what's the solution? So here are some specific examples. Uh, the 
Constitution Center, with the help of uh, Gary Lauder, who's here, and Laura Lauder, has conceived of a series of online exchanges that link classrooms in Philadelphia and California, or Ohio and Kentucky, for hour-long discussions moderated by a judge or master teacher. And it is so inspiring to see these kids from different parts of the country, red and blue America, with a constitutional question they're presented with, like, when can the police stop you in a minority community? learning about the text and history of the Fourth Amendment, being asked to separate their political from their constitutional views, and then voting before and after about whether or not they think the Fourth Amendment allows a particular stop. It is a thrilling model for both teaching substantive constitutional knowledge and also allowing kids to learn the habits of civil dialogue. And we hope that it will provide a model for adults and for civil dialogues of all kinds. It's exciting, Paula, that we're talking with you and the Chautauqua Institution right. about creating uh, dialogues around the country with, that local PBS stations might cover where citizens of different perspectives converge. It's crucially important for these dialogues. I think Michael Hill from Chautauqua and I agree, and I'm so excited that you're uh, open to this, not to have them about political topics per se. Because Correct. people are not going to agree about whether gun control is a good or bad idea. But you can ask, does the Second Amendment allow or prohibit gun control under certain circumstances? And by entertaining the possibility that you might think gun control is a great idea, but the Second Amendment prohibits it, or it's a bad idea, but the Constitution allows it, you really elevate citizens above politics, teach them about the Constitution, and have a civil dialogue. So that's a really exciting possibility. I want to share the most moving experience I had yesterday that is, for me, a model of the kind of uh, grounds up civil dialogue that you can imagine. So uh, Mike and Jackie Bezos, the Bezos Challenge, are going around the country to local communities and uh, enlisting folks to issue challenges to the kids to solve crucial civic issues. So I went to Louisville, and my challenge was uh, foster hard constitutional conversations in your community about constitutional issues that matter to you. And I didn't know what these kids would come up with. And I was kind of nervous, because I really wanted my team to first pick my challenge, uh, which they did, and then to win, which they, they also did. So they came yesterday, and they presented their challenge. And uh, I had suggested the First Amendment or the Second Amendment. These kids said, in our community, the fact that the police can stop us and stop and frisk us, and we don't know our rights, is unacceptable. So we have to educate both ourselves and our parents about what the Fourth Amendment allows. So they can be pastors and uh, civic leaders like the mayor and legal scholars. And they had a meeting in a town community center about leading Supreme Court cases, Miranda, Terry versus Ohio, Arizona versus Gantt. The kids picked these cases themselves. I didn't assign them. And these are the leading Supreme Court cases. And then the kids measured the knowledge of the Fourth Amendment before and after the dialogues. And they had pie charts. And substantive knowledge of the details of when the exclusionary rule applies and when it doesn't increased by a dramatic amount. I, I was in, moved almost to tears when I saw this, because it's just such a beautiful example of the kids on their own figuring out how the Constitution applies in their lives, enlisting adults, having a meaningful dialogue, and combining learning about the substantive Constitution with having civil dialogues. So I might would love to explore with all of you, and I encourage all of you to think about ways of convening these dialogues of people of different perspectives about constitutional issues among learners of all ages from 8 to 80, taking it online with the help of these exchanges so that you can unite groups from across the country, working with people like Paula to uh, b uh, bring it on uh, PBS, and saving American democracy in the process. The last thing I'll say is when Craig asked me to join the group that launched the report, I gave a very stern Jeremiah to the philanthropists who are in the audience. I said, it is a disgrace that all of you say that civics is an urgent national priority, and you've written this report saying that we have to support civics, but less than some, less than 1% of all philanthropic dollars goes to civics. The great foundations, Rockefeller, Carnegie, and so forth, that used to fund civics in the 80s and 90s for a series of reasons are not funding it. And there is not serious philanthropic support for physics, for civics. There is for physics, for STEM, yeah. but not for history and the science of government and the foundational principles of America 
without which the republic will collapse. So that's what I'm uh, saying to you as well. You think civics is really important? It sounds like everyone does because the report says we're not going to have a democracy unless we learn it. It's time to do exactly what Craig uh, said and put your money where your mouth is. Uh, one other place, and PBS, uh, our public stations are a great source for these dialogues, but a lot of places don't have them or the station isn't uh, taking an active role. And another place that we thought would be a good locus would be the local libraries because uh, there's one everywhere. And so we encourage the library community to step up in, in that respect as well. So yeah, it goes back to Carnegie, you're yeah. absolutely yes, right. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So we're going to, I'm going to ask one more question and we're going to have the last half of the session uh, involve you with your questions and dialogue. It doesn't just have to be a question, it can be a comment. Um, and that's to Craig, uh, one of the areas of uh, recommendation was that we have information fiduciaries. And you ran a, or you, uh, you don't run it anymore, the Craigslist, but uh, one platform. But um, how do you feel about the idea of having the, the gatherers of information have a responsibility to the user that goes beyond just data ownership or rights of privacy that go to a, a requirement of fiduciary duty to the user? Yeah. The deal here is that, like a fiduciary, like maybe a CPA or lawyer, they uh, have information on you and they have a duty of care to protect it and use it in an okay way. When it comes to a website, let's say a social media platform or a commerce site, they're going to be collecting a lot of data on you and you have to be able to trust them that they do the right thing. Now the term fiduciary here has too many different meetings and as a result I've seen people argue about that a lot mm -hmm. so I'm going to abandon the, uh, the phrase at least for now. But the idea is that uh, ethically uh, any website or commerce entity, anything like that, should have a duty of care for your data. They should tell you what they want to collect. Uh, they should tell you what uh, they uh, intend to do with it. You should have the ability to correct it, to uh, delete it as needed, to do all these things. Furthermore, if they want to share it with someone else, they again should uh, ask for your permission and all that. We're talking informed consent here. That's something I do feel strongly about. Uh, this echoes the uh, GDPR law in the European Union. Um, this echoes the equivalent law in, in uh, California, which is supposed to go into effect, I think, in about a half year. The idea is that if someone wants to, you know, if someone wants to share your data with you, it's your data, they need to ask for uh, permission, they need to ask for informed consent, and if they fool around with it or don't get it right, uh, there should be a, a penalty attached to that. For example, something we, fa we all face already right now is with credit bureaus. They often, they normally don't ask for your permission. They often get things wrong. They normally don't have me effective mechanisms to correct it. And sometimes for your safety, you need to freeze the distribution of that data. And speaking as a software engineer, I am most pleased when the web forms to freeze your data or unfreeze it actually work. And I am also pleased when, when things do break down, which is normal, there should be some ways of getting them fixed. Um, but I uh, won't pursue that tangent anymore, else I'll go to the way the, of the uh, Mandarin duck. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so this is a big issue, this is a big contribution. And action that I've taken is already in back channels talking with people of influence regarding law based in Sacramento. That's great. Uh, and, and I think the final point uh, that this commission suggested is that as Newt Minow did in 1961 when he addressed the National Association of Broadcasters, he said, you know, we're in a vast wasteland. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't good programming but you should get your act together, you broadcasters. And essentially, it's the same, and the Hutchins Commission, when they looked at uh, in the late 1940s and looked at the press and they said, you press should get your act together or you're gonna end up getting regulated. And what this commission said is you and media, 
platforms, and citizens need to take responsibility for this issue. This is not someone else's issue. This is your issue. Actually, Newton Minow's speech, the piece of that that actually he felt was more important than the vast wasteland comment was really about operating in the public good. And that's actually what we need to figure out how to get back to is operating in the public good. Great. So let's open it up to comments. Um, well, uh, sir? It's coming. And, uh, so what I'd like you to do is identify yourself. And if you want to identify uh, an institution, that's fine or not. Uh, my name is Ben Benson, and I spent 12 years on the board of KUT Radio, which is the NPR outlet in Austin. Great station. Pa it Great is a fantastic station. station. Thank you. Uh, Paula, last year you said uh, over in the Greenwald Pavilion that it was your opinion that one of the major factors that was diminishing trust in the media was a blurring of news and opinion. Absolutely. And my question for you is, and I'd like to probe into that further, what can be done? Is there, should we be looking for someone like Columbia Journalism Review to be doing an audit? of that, how can we address that issue? Because it does feel like I want to be able to look at a news outlet and know this, this is fact-based reporting and this is the opinion over here and not have them yeah. blurred together. And we, and we could talk at length about the, the, how this has happened. Right. And, and I think that part of the um, criticism of media right now is well-earned because I think in part because of behavior in social media where reporters are feeling more and more pressure uh, to, um, to create content or to, or to be posting on, on platforms to get people to click because that's how they're being judged. Um, Brett Stevens actually in this very room on a panel on, on, on uh, civil society just a couple days ago sat next to me and said that he felt that one of the uh, first things that media organizations should do is get rid of their trending list because, um, <laughs> you know, part of what, you know, we're talking about of, of just creating content that's not trustworthy, but it's also, it's, it's too tempting then for reporters to only be pushing content around stories that they think people will want to read rather than, than stories they should be reading. So I think there's a few things. One, as you mentioned, Columbia Journalism Report, um, uh, part of what um, they just announced, I don't know, a week or two ago, is that they will be funding um, public editors uh, for organizations like the New York Times, which have gotten rid of them. Now, I am very proud to say that I am one of the last media organizations that has had a public editor or ombudsman, if you like that more quaint title. And I think it's hugely important in terms of the integrity of, of the work that you're doing. So I think that goes a long way. So to have someone, not social media, that is opining on whether something is true or not, but to have someone who is a trained reporter who can actually get to the facts and find out if even well, in, you know, well-run media organizations, we all make mistakes to be able to drill in. So I think that's a piece of it. I, th I think the second is, um, it really does tie into um, just this breathless way that um, too many media organizations are, are covering news. And so you do cross over to, um, uh, and again, Brett in his comments, it, you know, it is very hard for journalists to put aside their own their own opinions, but if you are if you are reporting on fact, you need to report on fact and stop opining on whether on your own opinion about it. Your own opinion does not matter if you are a reporter. Now, there is nothing wrong than being a pundit, but I think that is different than being a journalist, and you just need to separate those pieces out. Um, there is an organization called the Trust Project. Uh, very briefly, has uh, published uh, so-called trust indicators, where you do want to do things like distinguish opinion from fact-based reporting. They also say it would be nice to have a code of ethics and even better to follow the code of ethics. <laughs> and regarding this CJ, regarding the CGR work, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, he, Craig was one of the uh, investors really in that. Really important. Uh, and the whole section on radical transparency is aimed at trying to help people sort out uh, and also recommended against reporters going on as pundits, by the way. Um, uh, yes, over there. Uh, my name is Greg Murray, and I was the. Uh, oh, let's get a let's get a mic. Well, we then it's for recorded. For the streaming, you will. Oh. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't realize there was a camera in the room. <laughs> uh, my name is Mike Murray, and I'm being recorded. <laughs> I also was the chairman of the. <laughs> I talk with my hands. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? No, get out. <laughs> and, and I think the separation of what's news and what's opinion is critical. Yeah. And that is the, you know, I, read, I quickly read through this, and it's really rather remarkable. But it, it good. But it, you know, it, it, the fundamental thing is I look, I look at someone and I say, I don't believe that, and why don't I believe it? And I then think about it, and I say, well, because I think he's getting money for what he's saying. Now, not money directly, and not maybe the, but Zuckerberg, did, how many people went to Zuckerberg's thing? But what did you think about his quite willing acceptance of the responsibility of controlling the quality of what goes over the network? Well, I, I'll comment from my own experience. Uh, so, um, and I know this is being recorded, so I'll probably regret saying all this, but, um, but the thing is, I think that the one thing I did take away from his presentation is, um, which I think he was trying to convey, is the complexity of all of this and their inability to be able to really uh, wrestle with the fundamentals. So we've had, uh, we're right now grappling with an issue with Apple, but we've had a major issue with, uh, with YouTube and then with Facebook. Um, all around uh, transparency. So one of the issues that's in your report. So the, the YouTube issue uh, was um, coming after the election, uh, their desire to label news content by source. And we were labeled as state TV. Mm -hmm. Where did they get that information? From Wikipedia. And so they, um, it took us, I think, close to nine months to get them to change that designation, that we are not the same as RT, we are not, we are not the voice of the government, that um, we are public television, which is fundamentally different. And the, 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 you know, I'm very proud of the trust that people place in us. It's, it's probably our most important uh, attribute. And so to undermine that with information that is incorrect, blunt instrument solution. The second issue I had with Facebook, Facebook began labeling our content as political ads. So material that Rainey Aronson from, from Frontline, who was on the night uh, report. So I think that um, part of, and that took many, many months to, to fix as well. So for me, it was a reminder of the fact that this, you know, these are complex issues. They're looking for very sweeping changes that hopefully can, can at least chip away at some of the issues of trust that they're wrestling with, but they're not sitting down with any of the people who actually could help them you know, craft solutions. Sit down with pointers, sit down with organizations, sit, sit down with Columbia Journalism Report, and, and, and make those, um, and, and make good decisions that are actually going to help the public discern the accuracy of the information that they're reading or can, seeing. Can I, can I say just one thing on the separation of fact and opinion? It's so important to empower the institutions that Paul is talking about to uh, make the distinction. But as this panel is designed to address, these institutions are under siege and people don't trust anyone to be neutral arbiters as Walter Cronkite was. The Constitution Center's solution is to convene liberal and conservative voices to write about constitutional issues on all platforms. And that is another way of ensuring balance while exploring areas of agreement and disagreement. So we have an interactive constitution online that has convened the top liberal and conservative scholars nominated by the leading liberal and conservative lawyers organizations to write about every clause of the Constitution, describing what they agree about and what they disagree about. And it's very inspiring to see how much agreement there is, but also disagreement. Okay, well, we have a podcast. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making, I'll, I'll plug the podcast, but the, the point isn't to plug the Constitution Center. It's to give you another model. Rather than presuming that we're ever going to really separate fact from opinion, recognize that at least on constitutional issues, and I think on many, there are good arguments on both sides. And just convening liberals and conservatives together to debate and discuss them is good. The podcast brings together liberal and conservative scholars every week to talk about the constitutional issues in the news. And finally, we're doing a great project with The Atlantic, which we're launching in September, called The Battle for the Constitution, that will systematically commission liberal and conservative writers to write about every constitutional issue in the news. So okay, that's what I'm gonna do I'm now to. is ask, uh, and we're just gonna get, get the questions or comments, and then maybe a last comment from the panelists, but let's get everybody, so Gary, Bill and this woman here. Yeah. Back to me. Okay, Gary. Uh, so, let's say who you are. Uh, my name is Gary Lauder. Uh, I'm a venture capitalist with uh, uh, cleverly named Lauder Partners. Um, 
Uh, so something I've suggested privately to some Facebook executives from time to time, um, and I would like to sort of get this concept injected more into this, uh, the public dialogue, is the notion of, um, unlike traditional media, which was a one-way medium, uh, using new electronic mediums where people read incorrect things all the time. Um, as Churchill used to say, uh, the truth gets halfway around the world before, uh, rather, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth gets its pants on. And um, with, with these new mediums, you can actually have um, the truth catch up with the, uh, uh, someone who has read a lie. Um, these platforms can track what you read, and, uh, and if something is debunked, uh, it, um, they, these platforms could, if they so chose, and if the user elected to be um, updated, to be told what the actual truth is and that the thing that they read was a lie. Okay. I think this concept is something that ought okay. to be discussed. They have the ability, so the platforms have the ability to get the correction to the user yes. um, in almost real time. Well, Just and however much time. Whenever time, whenever it gets um, and, and that's a critical thing today because uh, so often it, it, the, first, the thing that's fastest out of the gate is not correct. It's not correct, no. Bill, uh, let's get a, a mic here and then to Lakshmi. My name's Bill Kling. I'm uh, President Emeritus of American Public Media. I have a little bit of laryngitis this morning. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, Joshua Johnson was here the other day. Mm -hmm. Does the 1A program, which I think maybe some of you have heard. Brilliant young guy. Uh, he said, you know, it, it's great doing what I'm doing, but if we got every listener to public radio, not counting the online audiences and the podcast audience, but if we got every listener, we'd have 40 million people. He said, that's not enough. It doesn't make that much of a difference in a country of 330 million people. Last night, the debate, I think I saw this morning, had the highest ratings of any debate ever, 16. which is encouraging. But about a year ago, money got into the debates, advertising revenue, audience size, and all of a sudden we went from Jim Lehrer's style of debate to reality television. Last night was better, I think, but it wasn't anywhere near the kind of debate that's really designed to get uh, information out of people. So what I'm curious about <coughs> is what you all think about the role of advertising, of money, what drives Fox TV, for example, why do they do what they do the way they do it, what drives CNN, uh, what the role of public broadcasting will be as these changes come it revenue that's driving, uh, successfully driving audiences. Okay, and Lakshmi? Hi. Hello? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. great. Um, I'm Lakshmi Parthasarathy, and I'm Chief Operating Officer of Global Press, an international news organization mm -hmm. that operates about 40 independent news bureaus around the world. Um, we call them undercovered communities, like Zimbabwe, DRC, Indian Administered Kashmir. Um, and I just keep thinking about um, transparency and editorial processes and how we can help audiences understand how much rigor goes into reporting. You know, for example, we have GPJ Accurate. We show every translator that worked on the story, every reporter, every editor, and I feel like that process alone helps audiences understand that this wasn't just an opinion piece that, you know, came out of thin air. Um, for example, our, we had 93.5% of our source interviews were done in person in 2018. 97% of those were on the record. Um, so when I think about trust in local reporters that we're um, employing, it's actually at an all-time high for us. Um, and I'm wondering what lessons we can learn from, from this model. Um, and I'm only a year into the job, so I'm learning a lot on the, on the go, um, that we can apply to uh, local coverage in, in the US as well. And I'm sure PBS has a lot of examples of um, editorial processes and how to make them more transparent. Um, so, as, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, uh, Rainy Aronson, who's executive producer of Frontline, was on the panel, and transparency is something that she's very focused on. As you know, that's one of the last remaining investigative journalism programs, and uh, so part of what she has thought about is as, as um, issue around zero minutes remaining. 
uh, around transparency is to is to publish all the source material. So it's not just what appeared in the interview, uh, but to allow people who have the desire and interest to go back to look at the full transcript of what was discussed back and forth, so that you can make your own decision: did she get, did we get it right or did we stumble? That's one tiny example. Uh, but I think that there is there is many. If you if you think about the tools that we have with technology, there are a lot of things that we can do to try to open up the window even wider so that people can understand the source of information. Last comment, Craig and Jeff. Um, regarding the uh, Facebook and counter debunking uh, falsehoods thing, there's been a lot of discussion around it. I have to say it's about an hour's worth of discussion, uh, and I'm boring myself even as I think about it. It is far more difficult than you think because even if you have the lie debunked, there's a huge problem in artificial intelligence figuring out what was the lie and how to match it to the debunking, and then gets worse from there. And Jeff? And it's not funny at all. No. <laughs> I, I don't need the last word except to say that one theme you've heard is that uh, platforms and media organizations need to emphasize not popularity but truth. The fact that our media is so polarized, what does CNN and Fox and so forth want? They want clickbait, and what drives clickbait is polarized stuff and false news travels more quickly and widely than real news because it appeals to our base instincts. So the ultimate uh, fault is we the people who are, bless you, consuming this sort of stuff and the, bless all of us and God bless America. <laughs> Let's promote the truth. And I'll give the last, you know, you said uh, the last word. The last word of the Knight Commission was we are citizen sovereigns. We must act as sovereigns, take responsibility, and move forward. Thank you. Thanks.